it's very easy to sort of like talk yourself out of a bluff much more than make the bluff. And obviously it's very easy to value bet when you have a flush here or a straight here or set here. And obviously we're not beating value here with Ace-9. What's going on guys? Today's video features a conversation and hand review session with Carrot Corner coach, Justin Liu. Justin is the coach of the week. His first three videos are dropping on Carrot Corner for subscribers on Monday the 6th of May. His first three videos are the first three installments of his GTO deep dive series in which he analyzes to death the common and important spot of cutoff versus button three bet pots. Justin has become somewhat of our resident expert on this topic and so today we're going to go over a few hands sent in by Discord members that feature this important node. I've totally lost my voice. I've been recording content all day. I sound ridiculous. Editor. Put on some robot filter. In fact, even make me look like a robot for all I care at this point. Let's hide the fact that I just sound ridiculous right now. And so, yeah, guys. I hope you'll enjoy this as much as I did. I felt like I learned a ton from talking to Justin today. And I hope after the video is over, you may check out the subscription service at Carrot Corner and see what other goodies await you there. All right. Enjoy this one. All right, so I am here with Carrot Corner instructor Justin Liu, who is our resident expert in three bet pots, button versus cutoff. Justin, you've just recorded a really cool series that is dropping on Monday, this coming Monday, the 6th of May. It's going to come out the first three episodes. And it's like an opening repertoire in chess, right? It's basically like a complete foolproof roadmap to button versus cutoff three bet pots. Tell us a little bit about GTO Deep Dives. Tell us a little bit about why you chose this spot to cover in such depth. And let's hear a little bit about yourself as well. Like, What's your backstory with poker? So I met Pete a couple of years ago when I asked him to privately coach me. And I think he actually turned me down because I was a broke college kid with no bankroll, um, which says a lot about his character. But eventually, like I built a bankroll by playing um, low stakes and mid stakes online. And I took care of poker school as well and I got to be a pretty strong player and one of the things I think I can get better at and we can all get better at is really understanding the specifics of GTO right I think Carrot Poker School teaches us general concepts and it teaches us um, principles that we can apply to specific spots but part of being a good poker player is also just knowing the nitty-gritty of like what exactly is my hand doing in theory here like what is the exact or not not the exact but ballpark an accurate c bet frequency on this board for the button what is the check raise frequency looking like what does the range look like um i mean you can study all the general principles you want but it really helps to have specific knowledge of um, a spot like this and it makes it i think easier like before um i recorded the series I was scared to play button versus cutoff three bit pots, especially from the cutoff side, because it really feels like you're getting run over a lot. And the button seems to be, you know, in position with a stronger range going into the flop. It, you know, they're going bet, 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 and you just don't know what to do from the cutoff. You don't know like how to fight back. And so that would make me like, you know, fold a lot pre-flop with like hands that I should be defending sometimes. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do button versus cutoff, because selfishly I wanted to get better at it. And I thought there was no better way to than to force myself to record um, like a mini course on it, which is essentially what GTO Deep Dive is. Yep. And I think we could call it season one of GTO Deep Dive because the way you meticulously went through button versus cutoff three bet pot. And as you can see, guys, I've just switched to the cutoff here because I'd actually like to start by looking at this through the lens of the, the player that has the harder time here. But I think what we can actually say is that there's going to be a season two and a season three. I'm definitely confident that this is a series that you can produce for multiple spots. We could have like a blind versus blind GTO deep dive. We could have like a four bet pot GTO deep dive. Sky's the limit. So well, actually, my uh, well, my vision is to sort of have a library of of spot of the most common spots and do the same format for every spot and have because I think that's one of the things that when you go to sites like run it once and you look at their gto content a lot of it's general right and i'm not saying that doesn't have its place but when i look in the library for specific spots there i, I don't find many videos covering the ins and outs mm -hmm. of how to play these spots so i think it's something that you know it's a hole that i'm happy to fill mm -hmm. because again i think i have a selfish reason for it. i really want to get better at these spots myself 
So I'm happy to keep making these series. Yeah, and that's what we want from our coaches. We want you guys to be curious and keen and explore situations that you yourself are looking into or have recently looked into. We don't want you just making content that's generic and feels forced. We want you to be like almost broadcasting your own poker career and your progress through your educational content. And we're very big on that at Carrot Corner. So yeah, Monday the 6th of May, Justin's content is coming out there. The first three episodes of GTO Deep Dive will be live on Carrot Corner. Do click the link in the description and check that out. But before we get into this Queen 10 hand and find out how this Carrot Corner community member fared as the cutoff here with this flush draw, I'd quickly like to tell the audience a few facts I know about you. And I'll see if you can confirm these or or maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken. But one thing I know about you is that you are you're Oxford, right? And you're you're studying philosophy and politics, but mainly philosophy. And you're yeah. very sort of academic and, you know, you're, you've obviously got into a very good university that's very tough and demanding and challenging. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I do go to um, Oxford. I'm in my last year. I actually am writing my exams very soon. My degree is called philosophy, politics, and economics, but we can drop one subject after first year. And I chose to drop um, the economics. Um, so, yeah, I am basically just reading philosophy and politics. And uh, yeah, I think it's really helped, um, you know, develop my critical thinking. And I bring a lot of that in the series I made, I think. I think I take a very philosophical approach to some of these spots and sort of developing heuristics. I'm very big on like developing heuristics because when we're in a game, when we're um, playing a hand, Often, like, what helps the most is to have sort of general rules that work 90, 95% of the time. And even if it's like a hand that's one of those exceptions, if you follow the general rule, it will almost always be more or less okay. So I really try to, um, you know, use my critical thinking and problem solving abilities that I've developed in my academic life and apply it to the series yeah i found the same thing so i have a philosophy degree as well i didn't go to oxford i went to a much less prestigious university in glasgow called glasgow university um or university of glasgow but the the sentiment of that i couldn't agree more with because i found that after i did that degree poker just became easier life almost became easier right because you can just like navigate everything more more critically and logically but poker especially became easier because like philosophy, there are arguments, there are premises and conclusions. You have to weigh up arguments and say like which ones are more important, like which factors really matter, which ones don't. And you have to think critically a lot of the time. The other thing I know about you, Justin, is that I used to beat you at chess very easily. And now you're like 400 points higher rated than me, which is kind of depressing. And I'm an old man and I'm never going to get as good as you now. So that annoys me. But you went from like 1200 to 2100 or something like that in the space of like two years i've never really seen rating game like that apart from hans neiman and it's not clear that hans neiman you know didn't cheat for some of that whereas i don't think you did right don't want to say he did right did he didn't he but you organically just became a beast at chess like how did you achieve that while also studying at oxford and also making money playing poker like how did you actually do that so I definitely had to pause um, the poker side of it. Um, so one of the things I realized was, well, I always sort of had this goal in the back of my head that I wanted to get good at chess. But um, when I was sort of in my grinding days, when I was playing, you know, like hundreds of thousands of hands, um, it was basically impossible to get better at chess because like your mind is sort of focused on poker. You know, it, it, and, and even though I would, you know, like play on the side, it was never like, I was never able to get better. Um, so I sort of, after I sort of got burned out from playing poker, from doing a lot of volume um, after a while. And that sort of opened up the time and the energy for me to focus on chess. And it's sort of like when people ask me, how did I do it? It's not you know, I, I sort of just did what I thought was best to try to improve. And I sort of ended up improving, you know, as Bobby Fischer said, I just got good one day, you know, something like that. Now I still have like a long way to go. I think I can still improve more. 
and hopefully like I can become um an FM one day. That's sort of the end goal. Mm. Um but right now it's I'm sort of trying to focus I'm trying I'm trying to balance poker and chess. And it's often difficult. I, I by the way, I also have my exam. So both poker and chess are on the um sidelines right now. Mm-hmm. But after my exams are over, yeah, it's going to be I'm I'm going to try my best to balance these games. I think they're both extremely, extremely um engaging, interesting, fun games. Yeah. Awesome. So that's a little bit of a flavor of Justin's life, career, in and outside of poker. So I'm guessing, final question, then I really want to get onto this spot. When you graduate, are you more thinking about a career in poker? Or are you thinking about a career outside of poker? Do you, or have you decided yet? Yeah, so I'm definitely going to give poker a try for at least um, one or two years. And that was sort of a, an impetus for me to do the series was my GTO was, to be honest, very rusty. Um, because like I said, when, after I burned out, um, I really didn't like look mu- much at poker for a year or two. And that can be really detrimental to your, to just how sharp you are in, in, mm-hmm. in understanding, the, understanding GTO. I probably knew, um, I, I knew a lot of GTO after I finished, um, care poker school. And then I forgot, um, a chunk of it. And so I thought like by doing this series, doing other series in the future like this, it would sort of rejuvenate my knowledge for um gto which i think and it's not to say i'm a gto player by any means you know that i'm very exploitative player but Mm -hmm. it's extremely important to understand what the gto is in a spot in order to exploit in order to be that one step ahead of your opponent usually the person who understands the gto better will be the better exploiter in a in a in a one-on-one battle so yeah yeah very important to know exactly what's going on in these spots yeah i think it's like in chess if you're an expert and say the catalan or something and you play the catalan against someone you're going to be able to take advantage of their mistakes and inaccuracies better if you have a theoretical understanding of the opening right. that's stronger. So if you know what the best moves are and your opponent makes a move that is sort of anti-positional you're very likely to punish it um be- or, or know how to punish it because you know what the best move would have been you know how they were supposed to play and they didn't play that way. All that's required now is a, a bit of logical reasoning to figure out why their move is suboptimal and that allows you to punish it. So again, there's a very close relation there between chess and poker. Yep, love it. Okay, queen tennis spades. So going to start this one off at 25 and L sent in by one of our Discord members. We call a three bet with queen 10. We face the C bet and yeah, you've, you're the resident expert on this so i'll let you take the lead for this video what's going on here boards like ace high boards king high boards etc like high card boards those are going to be very favorable and a board like this an eight six deuce board it's still going to be favorable from an equity perspective but it's going to be less favorable than the ace and king high boards so that's why i call it sort of a relatively unfavorable board on relatively unfavorable boards in general the button wants to be using a bigger size and the size that i decided to sort of go with in my series is a 50 percent size on these types of boards and the reason for that is as we can witness here it's a very com- it's it's a size that people use it's a common size that i face um and when we're studying gto it makes sense to sort of study what we face um a lot of the times uh i think this is actually the correct size from villain here and for the cutoff here one of the things that i uncovered in the series is the check raise frequency and this was like a big question that i had going into it was like what should the check raise frequency be on these types of boards and it is actually much much higher than i thought and i expected it to be pretty high so on these sort of low boards the check raise frequency is going to be around 25 30 percent of range and what this means is like we need to be playing very aggressively as the cutoff and when you have a flush draw um flush draws check raise generally higher than the global frequency so that flush draws will check raise roughly around 50 percent of the time on average so this is a hand that if i'm hero here um i want to be check raising this a good amount of the time and an incentive exploitatively for check raising here is um villain is likely going to misplay the spot if you check raise whereas if you call villain is going to be in a spot where 
you're going to probably range check to him on the turn, he's going to have the option to double barrel. And it's much easier to play that node than to play the check raise node. Awesome. Yeah, so it's almost like, I think Mikhail Tal said it best when he talked about luring the opponent into a deep dark forest where 2 plus 2 equals 5 and the path out is only wide enough for 1. That The classic kind of chess player's quote about creating enough chaos that your opponents are actually in an environment where they can make mistakes now. And I think that's a beautiful point, that if we just call here, like, yes, it's fine, there's no problem with that, and if we're trying to play a balanced strategy, we will mix call. But we should note that most people, even if they're not highly skilled here, are going to do an okay job of handling the turn and position node here, barreling. Like, okay, maybe they'll be too passive on certain cards, whatever, maybe they won't value bet thin enough on a king or something like that. You can you can maybe pick apart, like, a few leaks they might have, but it's not a patch on the leaks they're going to have if you actually check raise the flop and lure them into that deep dark forest so i love that idea that if you are in doubt you might even do better by not rng'ing but by actually taking a rare line if you think there's minimal sort of you know exploitable consequences for that so with that outlined let's see what hero does here calls it goes check check does the series extend into some river situations and what would you say about a river situation like this where we kind of river something that looks marginal but then we have to be aware of the action sequence here and ask well how strong is this top pair are we allowed to value bet if so what sizes can we use and and what's going on here from like a theoretical lens on this river probe situation yeah so firstly regarding the series i did my best to cover as much as i could but once we're reaching the river the nodes are getting um a bit too deep even for gto deep dive so um, I couldn't really cover many river spots in the mm -hmm. main series. However, what I will say is um, in the bonus episodes that I did where I was practicing against the solver, obviously in those hands, we did reach some river situations. And all I'll say without spoiling anything is there were some insane, insane hands that I uncovered in those episodes. Um, spots where we were range jamming the river <laughs> with our entire range. Um, so... All I'll say is like you should definitely go check that out, and um, it was something that was very surprising to me, and I still can't like fully wrap my head around it. But um, I th I think I came to a relatively decent explanation in the video um, that I'm relatively happy with. I mean, GTO is so complicated that it's, it's hard to explain certain things. But yeah, that that was an insane river spot. This river spot is a lot less insane. Um, I think this is just a spot where we're in hero spot here. I think on the river, we want to be building um, two sizes here, probably a block size for hands like, you know, pocket sevens, uh, maybe pocket fives, hands like that, um, and also a bigger size. And I think queen 10 definitely falls into the bigger size category here. Yeah, and especially with the blocker here, like you're blocking the value bet of your opponent by having the 10, whereas when you have sixes, you're blocking a hand that would maybe check back, but would also call. So it, it comes down to this like carrot poker school I think this is grade two lecture five, right? Polarizing versus condensing blockers. Like this theme is also apparent here. And I think when you have a hand like the sixes, you're just going to face a bet way more often as well than when you face the 10. But it's a really well-made point about if your hand isn't strong enough to check raise usually, but it is strong enough to value bet, you're usually going to value bet. So yep, going big here makes some sense. I think having the block bet is something people miss because they miss the fact that the button just has to call a lot of non-pair to a river block, like a lot of non-pair. And even if that spot's overfolded a bit, you're still going to be able to take pocket sevens here and bet quarter pot and get enough crying calls, spew raises, etc. Especially if you want to make the read that people are not protecting the turn range. I mean, they're not meant to check this turn very often with an overpair, but if they're doing it even less than that, um, then you're gonna you're gonna do really well against raises as well. So yeah, let's see what Hero does here. Twenty five and L player, so I don't want to. I'm not going to expect that level of comprehension here. We do face a check. We do see a check, and I think this is just a common mistake people make where they don't really want to value bet because there's still this like looming specter there's still this monster under the bed that your opponent could have pocket aces or something and it's a three bet pot and you just imagine i think whenever you you embark on a three bet pot you just have this thing at the back of your mind when you're quite new to poker that is like your opponent can have a big overpair and you can't and that that fear is looming here on the river and causing people to make some mistakes on this node as played villain does check back they had ace five here that might not be a hand that's calling that might be a hand that if you could see it face up, you do want to check and hope it bluffs. But 
most of villain's range here is probably just like centered around ace king ace queen for the reason that you said earlier that people are missing these turn barrels with the more hybridy big big cards on the turn so really cool analysis there justin enjoyed it a lot five six open call we go for small here do you want to say a little bit about c bet sizing from button's point of view here is quarter fine would you ever consider a bigger bet on ace king eight because obviously the single race pots there's overbetting going on in this board. There's pot sizing going on in this board. Is that the case in 3-bit pots or is it okay just to do something small like this? So Ace-King-8 is about as good as it gets for the button. When you're in position as the button 3-better, there is quite a big risk when you open that you get raised, at least in theory. And the solver doesn't want to go 33% um, very much. When it does, it's almost always ace high, king high, or monotone flop. And in episode one, I sort of gave um, justifications for why I wanted to play the B33 strategy on those types of flops, as opposed to a B50 strategy, which the solver was also um, pr preferring. So it was preferring either the B33 or the B50, and there was a choice. And I sort of gave exploitative justifications for why I wanted to play B33 as the button here. I do think that B25 is probably too small here. Um, I would go B33. Um, it's a situation where, yes, the board is very good and it's sort of, you don't expect to get raised here, but actually even on this board, the cutoff raise frequency is quite high, at least in theory. And what that means is um, when, when we do reopen the action, we want to be betting, you know, for a reasonable chunk of chips. You'll see people do that because they're just playing their hand strength and they get away with it right at like lower stakes because people aren't raising enough but it's it is giving extra options to an informed player there when you do that in position the really crude example would be imagine you bet one big blind into a pot of 80 and all you're doing is basically giving the opponent another turn that's what you're doing right if you bet 180th pot and here when you bet 25 percent pot we're not quite all the way at 180th pot like a pointless reopen but it's on its way to like a more pointless reopen so that makes a lot of sense and we can bet, obviously, just like very high frequency here, I'd imagine. Yeah. And cut off calls. The turn is a queen. The button is supposed to be range betting the flop, pretty much. And um, it does seem like, okay, once we filter cut off on the flop, it seems like they have, you know, hands like queen jack and jack 10 that sort of um, call flop. Um, and now they, they hit the queen or, or they hit a straight or something. What I would say to that is like, first of all, um, those combos should be raising a decent amount of the time. So um, well, on a board like this, the two Broadway hands like Queen Jack, Queen 10, Jack 10 are going to comprise the majority of your opponent's um, check, check raise bluffs on the flop. The second thing to say is like they don't have the offsuit combos of them. They only have the suited ones. So it's a lot less combos than you think. And it's a lot more combos. The cutoffs range is a lot more combos of pocket pairs like seven, sixes, fives, fours. Even a board like Ace, Eight, Three, let's say Rainbow, you can actually just fold pocket sevens yep. um at a very decent frequency yep. facing a 33 percent c bet and that was sort of like surprising to me how much these pocket pairs below the ace can just fold um from the cutoff shoes on the flop and if we apply like some logical reasoning here if people are stationing the low pocket pairs too much on the flop what that means is your turn double barrels with bluffs will print ev um massively because where, whereas they were supposed to be folding like at a 70, 80, maybe even 100% frequency on the flop, like a hand like pocket nines here, let's say if the cutoffs had to pocket nines, that's folding 100% on the flop in theory. And if they even call that like 50% of the time or something, that's going to be a lot of you know additional EV for double barrels. Now, what I will say in this spot is what I want to do here is double barrel the turn. And then if we face a call, I want to sort of give up the river. And my reasoning for this is this is a board that it has a hand like pocket nines or pocket sevens. Like I mentioned, it feels to me like almost everyone's just going to fold that to the second barrel. It makes less sense to barrel the river for that reason. And the other reason is that people are sort of bad at understanding relative hand strength on these three Broadway boards and three yep. pots where the ranges are so wide. Mm -hmm. And people are going to overvalue hands like ace X, like ace five of diamonds or something, or um you know queen jack let's say if the if the river is a blank they think oh i have a pair and i block the nuts so like like we're gonna call this but actually like these are hands that because there are so many high cards and both ranges are so strong here you can't really just call every time you have 
a pair and a, and a straight draw blocker. Like that's just not going to work. So I suspect this is a spot that is going to get overfolded on the turn and overcalled on the river. And I've done my best to give my justifications um, in reference to what the GTO is on the flop turn and river. So double barreling here. It looks okay in this situation in position. We can be more liberal with our aggression in position and out of position. It's another theoretical concept you need to learn because you just have higher EV in position pretty much always. And the fold equity is higher as well in theory here. So if you're out of position, you're actually getting less fold equity in a solver than you would from in position. And that concept is has everything to do with why you see some very low EV bluffs happening from an in position player, but an out of position player will have higher standards usually. That's another cool concept. So the seven of clubs comes to the river. Paradoxically enough, I think the flush completing might actually make the um, cutoff less likely to call hands like ace jack or ace mm -hmm. ten. True. So like if you, I, I actually like hate a jam a lot less now than if it was like the seven of diamonds. Yep. Yep. I think in that spot we're probably just getting looked up too much by the aforementioned, you know, queen jack or king jack or stuff like that. You know, like the one pair hands with the straight blocker or even like too much top pairs probably calling us. You you could make the argument that ASEC starts to fold too much here. Um, I'm still a little bit worried though that we're going to get stationed too much by hands like King Queen, which is mm -hmm. probably indifferent um, in theory against a, a shove here, which is going to be like over pot. So, um, yeah. So when we're yeah. talking about people folding ace jack here, like they're probably supposed to. So it wouldn't take a lot of like ace jack looking you up on the seven of diamonds river before people are like grossly overcalling, right? So yeah, yeah. We're we're kind of saying that the fold equity here depends on villain realizing that like hands that do call down on some textures are now pure folds, and like if only like a third of the population is looking you up with like the king jack on the seven of diamonds river here, that's enough to make the spot grossly overcalled because no one in a solver is going to look you up with king jack right the solver is going to pure fold that combo i would imagine and therefore it doesn't take much human curiosity or stationary tendencies here before the spot is over defended and there's other situations where fold equity is very high on the river because humans are not calling enough with low absolute hand strength hands in the solver is so i'd say a very good rule is whenever people have to call you with a lot of low absolute hand strength hands like one pair or second pair or whatever in order to meet a defense frequency the spot's going to be overfolded. And when they have to call you, when they have to fold two pair or mix fold with two pair or fold a lot of top pair, the spot's probably going to be over defended. And it just comes down to the fact that if you're playing in a game like 50 NL or 25 NL, like this player is here, and it's a lot of a target audience, your opponents are just not good enough to react appropriately to relative hand strength and how that changes throughout these wetting textures. So we do jam and we do get the fold this time, which is, which is nice for hero. All right, let's do a couple more hands. Ace three, Jack nine seven. So this is the kind of board that when you first look at it, I think it appears to be more equalizing compared to some of the flops we've looked at so far. So this might again be what you would call a relatively bad flop for Button. Obviously, Button's still doing fine because it's Button, but this can't be like one of the best flops for their range, right? Yeah, in general, the best flops are going to be Ace or King High flops, non monotone, and so um, it's pretty easy to understand this rule. Like just the lower the top card is. Um, assuming we're talking about mo non monotone flops, mm -hmm. the worse it gets for the button. So a jack high flop like this, um, a middling flop like this, still going to be pretty good. Um, so um, the c bet frequency, assuming we're using the half pot size, is going to be you know roughly um, fifty percent or so. The main thing is we're in position and we really don't want to reopen the action. Um, at least in theory, like you said, Pete, like at lower stakes, the punishment for this is dished out a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, your opponent should be raising a lot against this and people probably don't. So I would suspect like this person sort of getting away with it more than they should be. Yep. But um, we definitely want to be playing a, you know, a half pot strategy here. It's the size that the solver likes to use cool. um, by a long shot. Yeah. Okay. And then we get to the Jack of Diamonds turn on the double barrel node. And Hero goes for a check here. So let's start by weighing up what we think of this turn and what this is doing in a theoretical lens. And then is this check okay? Is this hand allowed to slow play? Yeah, okay. So I'll, I guess I'll just assume that we played like a half pot on the flop mm -hmm. um, if we're going to talk about the theory here. Um, I don't imagine this hand will slow play 
very often. Um, flush is generally just double barrel. Um, and it's for the reason that like, um, when we check back the turn and there's, you know, three diamonds on the board and potentially a fourth one coming on the river, um, when your opponent reopens the action in theory, um, they generally use a smaller size. They use a 33% size. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're in the button shoots here and, um, obviously we have the effective nuts, we want to try to get stacks in, um, it's sort of a disaster if we check back because, um, from a theoretical standpoint, like even if your opponent bets on the river, it's going to be for like eight big blinds and like, you can't really jam over that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you knew your opponent was going to bet like 75% on the river, well then, okay, like, I guess we can check back mm -hmm. and try to like, see that, see that bet and then jam over it. But for that reason, it just doesn't make much sense here from a theoretical standpoint to check this back. Um, we definitely just want to be betting basically every flush at full frequency. So villain for all we just said, does go for the over bet on the river. And this is a really weird note now. What do you make of this? So, so maybe the ace high flush can jam in theory, but I'm actually starting to get scared in practice. There are a lot of boats here, um, and people are pretty passive on flop on flop when they should be raising um, sets basically full frequency. A lot of do, people. Do you think that's them. true on this board as well, though? Yes, like against yes. quarter, even against quarter pot. Yes, they should be raising very high frequency. Right, um, I agree with that. But do you think people slow play them a lot in this exact spot, like out of position against a tiny bet on a really wet looking board? Because well, I would the guess is, they do it less there. The thing is, if you're supposed to raise 100% in theory, sure. even if they raise 75%, they're under raising. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, think that, I think that what the range they get to on the river will be actually more boat heavy than right. um, what a solver would say. Mm -hmm. I'm actually starting to get a little bit scared. And I'm like not so sure that people will overbet here with hands like king 10 enough to allow for us to jam here and get called enough by worse hands so i think this is close with the ace high flush definitely not jamming the king high flush and i think you make a good point that there probably will be a bit more boat here than there's meant to be villain just had the the deuces defend more a testament again to the fact that people are defending over defending flop in many cases in these sort of situations deuces with a diamond seems probably like a fold to third pot and Probably a full to quarter pot as well, I would guess, just because it's so hopeless in this node. Ace nine of clubs on button. Go for this very small looking sort of ISO three bet here. Call and king eight seven. So again, one of the higher EV boards for range. We've talked about this to death. I don't think we need to beat a dead horse here. And we go for third pot, which seems kind of reasonable on this texture to me. Villain calls. The ace turn is going to be very high EV for button here, right? This is going to be like one of the, the best turns in the deck because ace X without hearts is going to be the most folded part of the cutoffs range. So we're, we're looking to play a ton of like B60 or B66 or B70 or whatever you want to do here, I would imagine would be, would be common in this node, right? Anything you want to say about the turn here? I think it makes sense to play a polar strategy here, a B75 strategy. I wouldn't include this actually in if if I'm playing a B seventy five, I would sort of bottom out at ace ten for the volley for the value range and um bluffs will be like jack ten, ten nine, etc. Flush draws. Okay. That surprises me. I thought something like ace nine would probably get in there, but I suppose there are less with the eight and the seven being on the board here, there's a bit less ace X that you're actually quote unquote coolering on this node and ace four, ace five or very often four betting pre ace two ace three or folding pre so ace nine is like kind of way down there in the ace x category it depends how big you're going if you're b 60 in here it might get in but not for 75 or something but yeah it seems like a reasonable analysis okay so we do check back which is obviously fine the 10 of hearts comes on the river I, i'm getting the sense that this is going to be one of our more exploitative nodes now billing goes yeah. for the sizing and my first thing instinct here is yuck what do you think about this spot? Yeah, I'm folding. I want out. Um, there's there's just a couple of things here. Well, not even if it wasn't the 10 that completed the flush, I would be quite scared here. Given it's the 10 that completes the flush, mm -hmm. like if you actually think about the cutoff's range going into the flop, and we've actually already filtered him on the flop, um, even if it was an unfiltered range, it's like basically impossible to have quote unquote nothing here. Every hand is at least a pair. Mm -hmm. um, even Jack Nine is, is somehow straight. So this is literally a spot where you cannot have an, a non-pair hand. And therefore, um, by the river, since we filtered him, he, um, by logical necessity, he has to be turning pairs into bluffs. And I'm sort of doubtful. Like, for example, 
um, a hand like pocket sixes, pocket fives, like those hands are pure folding flop, even with a heart. So when we actually think about like what types of hands are that, that he can even have to bluff the river with, he might even need to just start turning um, hands like seven, six suited, nine, eight suited into bluffs. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. I just think that, okay, like a, a very skilled player might find that, um, but it is a difficult um, to find um, because like you, if if I have nine, eight suited here, um, maybe I might find the bluff, but I might think, oh, maybe I have, you know, pocket sixes, pocket fives, pocket fours that I can bluff first, not realizing that those hands should be just folding the flop here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's very easy to sort of like talk yourself out of a bluff much more than make the bluff. And obviously it's very easy to value bet when you have a flush here or straight here or set here. And obviously we're not beating value here with ace nine. Um, there's just no chance that opponent can bet a hand like ace five if he knows what he's doing for value here for this size. So we have a bluff catcher in a criminally under bluff spot. So we should just get out of here. The reason calls like this get made. Not saying hero calls here, I don't know. But the reason some people do call here is they feel that they've underplayed their hand. This is an awful thought process that is like one of the, it should be one of like the cancelled terms in the carrot poker school. There's some things in that course where we go through and say, this is not a thing. This is not a thing. Don't ever do this. And I think like I have underrepped or underplayed my hand is really arbitrary here and just doesn't engage with the fact that like you have a bluff catcher and a really under bluff node. So countdown from three. What does hero do? Let's pray for a fold here, guys, for this final hand of the video. We do call. It's a familiar tale. I'm not surprised by this. I see a lot of students call with this hand in this spot and it, it basically just reinforces what we're saying when hero has high absolute hand strength for the action sequence pair of aces that check the turn they're just not willing to fold the river because they're too drawn to their absolute hand strength they're not hand reading they're not exploiting this doesn't even really look like a great call in gto this time we wow. win we run into a player that wow indeed we run into a player that actually realizes where they are in their range and this is a very good play by the opponent here i'm a big fan of this unfortunately he's run into like our stationary discord member this time so too bad villain 10 but you got to give it to him for heart all right well this is this has been fun gto deep dive loads more from justin Liu coming out in carrot corner after that as well but on monday the 6th of may gto deep dive episodes one through three are dropping make sure you're subscribed so that you can watch them on the day that they go live do click the link in the comment section there to go over to Carrot Corner and get your subscription if you haven't already. We've got loads more cool content coming your way soon also. And Justin and I are now going to go and record a video on his own YouTube channel. Do you want to just briefly tell them what your channel is called? Yeah, it's called J Liu Poker. So J-L-I-U Poker. Um, it's a very new channel. It's a channel that I've been posting much content because I'm studying for exams and I just can't right now. But um, once I go pro in June and I have a lot of gameplay and um, solver analysis and stuff there will be a lot of um, content just like this where i'm looking at hands or if i'm playing online that i'll post so definitely go check that out um, and i'll uh, hope to see you there all right guys see you next time on carrot corner bye for now carrotcorner.com that's the place to be run by the carrot man he's got the strategy if you want to up your game and step in chips Carrot corners where the wise ones make flips. Carrot tape chips, that's the way to be. CarrotCorner.com for the poker strategy.